Welcome to this series of Minerva Dialogues. I'm Professor Brad Evans, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by Dr. Jenny Scott, who is a senior lecturer in pharmacy practice and also an active practitioner as well. I'm delighted to be joined with you, Jenny. Um, I'm here, Brad. Maybe we can start then, if you can tell me a bit about your research and also some of your practitioner work as well. Okay, sure. Uh, well, I'm interested in harm reduction, the reduction of drug-related harm and working with people with addiction. And I suppose I broadly do two main things. I look at injecting risk and risk reduction and sometimes um, that's about interventions and policy. Sometimes it's about development of a needle exchange equipment. Um, and the other thing I'm interested in is how pharmacists can use their uh, knowledge and skills to work with people who have addiction problems to reduce harm, to improve treatment, improve treatment outcomes. So that's the research. I also teach around that area as well and other things. Um, and in my practice, I work as a prescribing pharmacist. So, um, oh goodness, 15 plus years ago now, pharmacists could, could start to train as prescribers. So I've been doing this role for 11 years now. I work... Um, drug and alcohol treatment service, not, not that far from uh, here. And um, I basically run clinics, mainly, mainly seeing people who are new into treatment, starting prescribed medication, but I also um, support people who uh, have problems with prescribed medication. So they might be addicted to medicine they've originally had for a therapeutic reason as well. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. me. Well, I, I want to, um, I think obviously it's phenomenally important work that you do. Um, I want to bring it perhaps then directly, oh, immediately to the question of the pandemic. Um, now, I think one thing that we become very aware of very quickly is how the pandemic, first of all, revealed a lot of things which was already broken in societies, a lot of the problems that are already in societies, but it's also exacerbated a lot of problems as well. Now, if we understand, of course, the you know alcohol abuse and the misabuse of substances, as being a real chronic problem that the society faces anyway. What do you think has been the impact, first of all, of the pandemic? And how have you seen and what have you noticed that's been particularly troubling about the pandemic in the context of uh, drug misuse? Okay, that's, that's a really good question. I think um, the impact has been complex. I think it hasn't always been negative. Um, I can draw from two main things, what I see in the clinic, and also I've been involved in some research that's being led by the University of Bristol around the impact of the pandemic on people who use drugs. And I think what we're seeing is some people are actually doing better, um, depending how you measure better, of course, better as in the self-report, they're using less drugs, they've perhaps been able to stick to the medication, um, they are not interacting socialising with other people who use drugs. But, of course, they're spending a lot of time at home and alone. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's sustainable, whether that actually that might tick a box in terms of recovery on, on a government form, but is that the quality of life people should have going forward? Mm -hmm. um, but there have also been other people said, actually, there's been more support, particularly homeless people, because they've been moved into uh, hotels and hostels homeless people are telling us, actually, I, for the first time I've been able to access mental health support, help with money, you know, people are around me trying to support me and help me move forward. And, and we have seen and heard um, some homeless people do well in terms of, um, you know, more stability, more security. I think that, that, that sort of evidence for, for Maslow's hierarchy, you know, if you meet people's basic needs, they, they're then in a position to, to develop and do well. Um, but you asked me to emphasise the negatives as well. Mm -hmm. And I think um, alcohol, you mentioned that there's been a, a, a big increase in people's drinking. I think people have not got the same boundaries that they had before. You know, I won't drink on a Sunday because I've got to get up and drive to work on a Monday. If that becomes actually I'm working at home and it doesn't really matter if I'm at my desk smelling of alcohol or feeling a bit rough, I can, you know, that that boundary has, has gone for some people. So I think definitely alcohol use in, in people who perhaps previously would categorise themselves as social drinkers. Um, and then I think, of course, the pandemic has exacerbated poverty, you know, and, and we have seen people do less well, 
because um, they've lost their income. We've seen people whose mental health is being really negatively impacted from the isolation. Um, and I think people have just found the, the lack of connectedness really troubling. You know, they, for addiction services, a lot of work is remote. You know, apart from face-to-face -face appointments with, with with new patients, many many appointments are done the phone, and I think a lot of people are really feeling that lack of connectedness, that, that not being at groups, not being in in counselling sessions, not having somebody there to to see a face rather than a voice. Um, so I think I think there are there are casualties as well as. I don't like the word winners, but but people who perhaps their circumstances ha have improved. Mm. Yeah, there's there's so many interesting points on that. I think the, the first thing about, um, and I think even I can relate to this this kind of collapse in the ordinary structure of life. You know, when does the working day end? And now, when does it start? You know, I think all of us are facing these disruptions, and I think that can be very challenging for people. As you say, particularly people who have were prone to addictions. Anyway, I, I, the picture you paint of addiction then in, in that way is kind of. It's a very complex story why people get involved in drug use and why they become um, users and, and then become addicts. And I, I was really struck actually by that kind of, um, on the one hand, as you say, there's um, something about the socialization aspect which has been removed, that people don't no longer feel amongst their peers the need to take the drugs, which can often be, you know, I guess a big motivation for people using the drugs. But then I think it's quite tragic what you then present in terms of thinking about just social policy, how, it takes a pandemic for people to take homelessness seriously. And when, you know, and it's too often that we find that people vilify homeless people as just drug users, whereas actually maybe it's just an escape for the life on the streets. So is that your experience with the research or? I think what you said about the complexity mm -hmm. is, is probably the answer. I think people, people who have addictions are very often, um, using substances to cope with past trauma. Mm -hmm. And I think past trauma, adverse childhood events, people are not necessarily prepared f for, for the outside world and for, for adult life. They perhaps for a multitude of reasons like exclusion from school, not developing resilience, um, you know, abnormalities, if that's the word, and, in, in the development of their personalities and the securities and attachments that, that, that should, should all be there. Um, and then it's hard for people to cope and people end up homeless. But also, if you are homeless, getting off your head for a few hours or just escaping from the reality of that awfulness through a substance mm -hmm. is completely understandable. Mm -hmm. You know, completely understandable. And yet, at the same time, people are incredibly vulnerable incredibly vulnerable the the abuse they experience mm -hmm. when they're homeless on the streets is huge and then that feeds into feelings of self-worth or lack of and and what people deserve and then coupled with the effects of substances it, it just builds a really difficult picture mm -hmm. i think you know coming back to what i said earlier about about maslow's hierarchy that you really do need your basic human needs met in order to be able to just look beyond the immediate and to think about tomorrow, to think about next week, to to feel that you deserve to move on and, and to have that strength. Mm -hmm. So I think what the pandemic has allowed, that great opportunity to, to get homeless people under shelter, you know, the motivation being that the sense that they'd all be infectious and spreading it to mm -hmm. decent people, however, you know, perhaps that's too cynical. But but nevertheless, we are seeing great benefits from people having shelter mm -hmm. and access to support. I just hope it's sustained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to pick up on also that, connecting that to this kind of, this differential experience of vulnerability that you talk about and how this then connects to ways in which we can 
Um, the limits you said about, you know, dealing with this kind of support for people in this age of lockdown. And, you know, I'm sure, maybe you can elaborate more on this, but I'm sure for you as a researcher and a practitioner, you have to build trust with the people you're, de you're dealing with. So, you know, so what do you think then in terms of the challenges that you're facing now as a researcher and a practitioner? Because one of the things which I find, you know, going into lockdown makes us reveal actually how remarkably privileged we are. It's a privilege to lock down and to work from home and to live from home in that way and to have the luxury to do that, which a lot of people don't have. So for you in terms of then as a researcher and as a practitioner, what's the challenges when you have to, you know, much of it's based on face-to-face -face trust. The people know you, they can speak with you, they can talk to you in confidence. You know, the computer screen eviscerates all that, surely. Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think you know, you've nailed it there. I think that that rapport that you build face to face, you know, if you go to a drug service and you hang about in the waiting room to tell people about your research, offer information sheets, tell them I'll be back next week. Um, you know, if you if you go with outreach teams and you, you go on the streets to meet people, all of that allows you to slowly build connections and trust. So you know, if, if you um, you gain the trust of the service provider and they facilitate access to to their client group, that's a privilege. And, and to show yourself as interested, genuine, trustworthy, um, confidential, it's much harder to do that. Mm -hmm. And a bit of paper that's passed on electronically or in the post and, and then by telephone, I think... It's a, it is definitely a challenge. Um, and also, interestingly, related to that, one of the challenges that when we rely on gatekeepers for our research at the moment, particularly, so services to give people information and then ask them to, to express an interest, we really have to work hard to keep it on their agenda mm -hmm. and, and to remind them to give out information sheets to ask people because they're busy, they're doing new ways of working, they're having difficult conversations on the phone that, you know, akin to the research, they're easier to have face to face. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're talking to someone on the phone in a clinical appointment about a difficult issue, you're probably not going to want to raise the question of, and um, would you like to take part in an interview mm -hmm. or would you like to speak to these researchers? So there are big challenges, I think, for us to to just keep our research on the agenda and to try and 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 and, and have that connectedness. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I um, have seen done in a couple of research projects, including the one I've been involved with with the team at Bristol, is rapidly feeding back to the organisations that help with the recruitment. Mm -hmm. So rather than waiting till you've done your detailed analysis, just taking the headlines from listening to the recordings, taking the headlines, you know, going through them and putting together a very, very uh, brief and, and, dare I say it, quite rough synthesis of the key things we're learning and then send that back to the organisation to keep on their minds and in their agenda and to see some, some benefit from their efforts quickly. See, this is what we're learning. Is there anything from that that strikes you that you think we should explore further? And that's quite a helpful thing to do. Mm. I want to bring this then now on to uh, the other aspect of your role, obviously, which is an educator. And um, I'm wondering in terms of, especially maybe in terms of, we look at the news recently and some of the demonization, actually, of the student community, I find quite difficult to, to stomach. But I wonder, first of all, what are your fears maybe right now for the student population in terms of questions of mental health, um, alcohol abuse, even drug abuse. And how do you think that you, you know, what you respond to this as an, as an, as an educator? What are the challenges there for you, you think, now, working in a university environment, which is not, of course, separate from the real world. It's, yeah. it's heavily invested in it. So how do you come at this in your role as an educator? And what are the challenges from that? So your concerns and your challenges in that regard? Gosh, I think there's quite a few issues. I mean, for our new students... I think this year, more than any year, I've thought about them being away from home for the first time. I've thought about them being in this environment. I've thought about them not having the same experiences as, as perhaps students usually have. But I've kept 
better contact with them. Um, I've had more engagement. I've asked them these things. I've met them on campus and we went for a walk around the, the campus and, and just speaking to them about how is it for you? Are you okay? Um, if they've had to isolate, just basic stuff like, have you got everything you need? Do you need any help? Have you, have you been in contact with, with all the support that's available? Um, so that's one of my fears. I think for the other year groups, I think perhaps we have to not make assumptions that, that online learning uh, is something that will naturally suit everybody's learning style. And I think we have to ask them, and this is what we're doing with, with our students, we're teaching mental health at the moment. Um, we're meeting with them once a week online just to say, how's it been? How was last week? Any gaps? Anything didn't make sense? Do you need any help? Have you managed to go through everything? You know, what, what uh, you know, we can't change really the teaching for them this year. Um, but, you know, what could be different? Should we be in this situation next year or again? Um, so I think that's two, two issues, immediate issues. I think longer term, something that is in my mind is, you know, we're training healthcare professionals and we have, um, I wouldn't call it a formula, but, you know, we have a course which is uh, approved by our, our professional regulator and we think and, and, and understand is well designed and it produces really good pharmacists really good pharmacists that good employers, top employers, top NHS trusts want to employ. Our students do really well in the, um, the post-graduation employment year, when the way they're all ranked nationally and, and are offered jobs. Our students do really well in that. And I guess right now we're all thinking, what kind of pharmacist are we going to be producing with these different ways of teaching? In particular, the one that we're working out at the moment is the, the, pl the placements, the patient work, because you absolutely have to do that when you're learning to be a healthcare professional. And so there is that question that no one really knows the answer to yet as to will they be the same? Will a bath pharmacist who graduates next summer, summer after, and so on, be the same as the bath pharmacist who graduated last year, this year, previous years? Mm -hmm. So... I wouldn't say it's a biggie, but it's just at the back of my mind, you know, are they going to be different because they haven't had that same interactive experience? Mm -hmm. um, in person, anyway, actually. Having said that, the interaction's gone quite well online, but the in-person interaction. Yeah, and I think your point at the beginning as well is really important about it. Often we can sometimes forget how young and how much support they need. And if, I think this has made it very evident, actually, through... As I said, I myself have had more contact with the students consciously and also for them as well, feeling that maybe they feel like they can actually get in touch with you more now. And I think that's, that's, that has to be a positive for us, I think. You know. Absolutely. And I think the thing I've thought about this year that, that bizarrely hasn't really struck me in previous years is how they come in not knowing how to navigate us, mm -hmm. not knowing everything from what to call us, whether it's doctor or they use your name, to, well, is it okay to email you? Is it okay to ask? What's the etiquette? What's the protocol? How much do I have to do on my own? How much can I ask you about? I haven't really noticed that so much in previous years, and, and it's been more apparent this year, and actually much easier to just say, right, let's, let's all chat, you know, send them an invite to an online discussion. Let's all have a chat about what we're doing with our revision notes, how we're making our revision notes, what we're doing after we've watched a lecture, how we manage and to motivate ourselves and keep on top of things. And it's mm. actually been easier than when we physically have to get them all in a room at the right time and timetable and work around everything. I think our timetables are mine, certainly, is a bit more flexible at the moment. Mm. It's not so much administration meetings. <laughs> I'd like to ask you then just you know a couple more questions. One in terms of um, your research trajectory and what does your research look like for the next foreseeable future? And what are the you know what are the real research questions that are really occupying you right now? And if you have time to even think about research, but you know how do you see the field in which you're operating and developing over the next couple of years? I mean, okay. 
I mean, I, I came into research because I had the opportunity early on to see that it makes a difference. And I think anyone who wants to be a healthcare professional has that motivation. You want, you want to do something to help people. That's what you want to do. You want to look after people who are unwell or, or have health issues. So in terms of research, research trajectory, I can't even say that, <laughs> research trajectory, um, I, I would really like to start seeing more developments and practice of things I've contributed to. One of the things I've learned over the last 10 years with a combination of changes of research, climate, um, maternity episodes, having family part-time working is the need to joint work and to joint work with good people who you have a shared vision. So I'm very fortunate that I work with people who we share the same goals. We want to create interventions, healthcare interventions that make a difference. So what I'd really like to do, um, I've got some work going on at the moment. I've developed a, a, a modified way of supplying um, a medication that used an overdose, to, to an antidote to overdose in the pharmacy setting. And that work has gone really well and COVID has given me the opportunity to roll that out in a pilot. And then I found out on Friday that it's being rolled out in another location as well, end of this month. What I'd really love to see in five years' time that every pharmacy in the UK was using that intervention and was commissioned to provide that because we have um, record drug-related deaths. Now, it's not the answer. It's not going to stop them all. But if that could be part of the response, that'd be amazing. I'd love to just develop interventions that make a difference for people. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the plan. I wouldn't say I have a, a massively grand plan. Um, I take the opportunities as they come along. I work with some, as I say, some great people. We'd really like to improve hospital care for people that use drugs as well. So that, that's another thing on the agenda. Uh, it might not be a massively grand plan, but it sounds massively important. So yeah. I, think, I like um, massively important, not massively yeah, grand. Yeah, I think that, 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 we can <laughs> stick with that. And I, I think, you know, like, like all of us, you know, if we're not you, in, particularly in a university setting, to believe that we can change the world for the better, then why are we even you, right? I, I agree with that fully. So, and I guess just one final question that I'd like to ask you and maybe end on a more positive note, you know, even in terms of all the very difficult work that you do and the difficult situations you find yourselves in, what makes you optimistic right now? What makes me optimistic? Do you know, it's quite hard to be optimistic at times. Mm -hmm. um, but what makes me optimistic is the people who take part in my research and my, and my clinical work because they have experienced adversity that most of us would never know. And they have grown up in environments that are horrific. And they have had things done to them they've got no control over. And they're in situations that, that many people would see hopeless, and yet they are, they're, they're interesting, they're motivated to do things, they're, they're funny, they're all different, they, are not, they don't match stereotypes. They, they want to survive and they want things to get better. And I think for me it's about that, it's about people wanting to help other people to make things better and move forward. I think it's hard at the moment for various reasons. Um, but it's what makes me optimistic is the enthusiasm and the energy that I do see from people themselves who use drugs and who want to improve the situation for others. Definitely. Well, I think we can end on your phrase, they want to survive. I think that's a really powerful way. So thanks for your time, Jenny, for sharing your thoughts on your important research. Not at all. Thank you. It's been fun.